Okay. So, uh, welcome everyone to the ongoing uh, S2S webinar series. Uh, the webinar today will have a series of speakers talking about the impact of aerosol on um, S2S on subseasonal prediction. Uh, this webinar is going to focus on the second phase of the Wigney aerosol project, expanded by collaboration with the S2S steering group to include experiments on subseasonal time scale. The speakers today are Dr. Ariane Frassoni, who's going to talk to us about the protocol and the rationale for the protocol for the model intercomparison and the types of experiments that are being asked. <clears throat> and doctors and Angela Benedetti, Donifan Barahona, and George Grell will speak to us about results from the experiments that they performed or are going to perform in their centers to look at the impact of aerosol and aerosol cloud feedbacks on subseasonal scale forecasts. So our first speaker, again, Ariane Frassoni from the Brazil National Institute for Space Research. Ariane? Yeah, I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK. So good, e good e uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Andrea, for the introduction and for the invitation to talk about the Wigner Aerosol project. This is a joint uh, collaboration between GO, uh, WWRP, S2S, Steering Group, WCRP, um, and counts with the collaboration with the Wigner members, myself and Francois Elgenbrecht, Angela Benedetti and Frederic Vittar as the WWRP S2S members in the Goal Scientific Advisory Group Modeling Application SEGAP uh, members, George Graham, Paul McCarr. So I'm going to talk about the, the Wigner Aerosol project. Uh, and firstly, I would like to highlight the importance of aerosols for the climate forcing, as a climate forcing. Because of the, the, the aerosols uh, act as uh, uh, they, they scatter or absorb uh, the radiation, incoming solar radiation, and affect directly the planet's energy balance. Aerosols also can play an important role, uh, changing the life cycle and the properties of clouds, uh, acting as a cloud condensation nuclei, and uh, also indirectly affect the, the planet. Uh, energy balance. Uh, aerosols also can play an important role um, changing the temperature profile of the atmosphere uh, by the semi-direct effect, uh, also changing the cloud properties and the stabilization of the atmosphere. And uh, this is why the aerosols are so important for a climate for as a climate forcing. Uh, it's important to know how aerosols can impact the uh, numerical forecasts in different time scales. And Wigney in 2015 started uh, studying the, uh, the impact of aerosols on numerical weather prediction skill uh, by studying in a st st case study basis different types of uh, aerosols, including dust, pollution, and smoke in different areas of the globe, and uh, identified that uh, the aerosols can play an important role in, in the skew of short-range forecasts. As Wigney's uh, purpose is foster the development of uh, Earth system models uh, for using different time scales and different uh, um, uh, in different uh, um, spatial scales as regional and global models. Uh, we need diagnosis and uh, the, uh, systematic errors in models by uh, providing uh, sources of uh, knowledge 
in promoting experimentations, numerical experimentations, like the, Wigney, the first phase of the Wigney aerosols project, to try to under, better understand the numerical processes and solve shortcomings. For more information about the Wigney, you can access the website. Uh, the, the first phase of the Wigney aerosol project was led by Dr. Saul Freitas, and the Wigney decided to promote the second phase of the Wigney aerosol project that includes a more systematic uh, study in the short range forecast and also extending the study to uh, longer time scales like the sub seasonal time scale. And why to include sub-seasonal time scale? This is a schematic illustrating uh, the S2S weather and climate gap. Here we have the, uh, the prediction skew of numerical models, ranging from hours to months lead times. And we can see here in green the weather events that can be predicted, like uh, thunderstorms, uh, hurricanes, and other kinds of uh, 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 short-lived uh, weather events. Uh, in, a, in the longer time scales, we have a seasonal prediction that uh, is uh, among three to 12 months of lead times. And uh, they, the seasonal prediction is basically uh, influenced by uh, uh, sea surface temperature, and in, in recent studies, aerosols are also playing an important role to improve the predictability of the atmosphere in this, in this seasonal time scale, like the, the, the work developed by Juliana Frey that is, is here in us today. And between the weather events uh, predictions that is influenced especially for the initial condition uh, of the uh, a, 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 a source of predictability of weather events, we have between the weather and the seasonal dash to uh, sub-seasonal uh, time scale. That uh, is an open question that uh, should be better understood and uh, to improve the capability of the models to uh, forecast events like heat, heat waves, storm tracks, severe weather, treats uh, that are included in this time scale. So to improve the predictability of the, the atmosphere in this time scale, uh, many studies have been conducted. And one of these is to better understand the aerosols impacts uh, in this uh, time scale. And this is an open window to, to improve the model capabilities, incorporating and integrating the atmospheric composition together with the weather and climate description in the models. And this is, should be provided by a joint project that includes efforts from different communities like uh, 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 WCRP, WWRP, and GO, uh, as WIGNI serves for all these communities. Uh, all then are represented at WIGNI, and uh, this is a collaborative uh, project that will uh, uh, bring for the community. Uh, knowledge about the impact of aerosols on this time scale. Uh, and nowadays, a few operational numerical weather prediction centers are capable to fully run an integrated weather, climate, chemistry, numerical models. Um, is, this is true for uh, fully coupled modeling systems uh, that run uh, operational models in longer time scales like S2S. So this is important to understand and to uh, uh, push the, uh, the research uh, for the better representation of numerical models uh, to better uh, uh, to better have have better uh, results for the models uh, for this time scale. And this is one of the the, the, the reasons that the S2S WWRP WCRP project recognize the importance of aerosols to be included in numerical models because nowadays all the operational S2S models contributing to the project uh, use climatological aerosols that are fine, but they don't represent uh, intense events like, for example, the California uh, wildfire that occurred in the last year 
the, the Amazon wildfires that occurred in 2019, 2000, 2022, in the Pantanal, like for example. So this kind of intense events has a huge impact in the quality of numerical predictions. So the incorporation of aerosols on s s models is an, an opportunity to improve the, mod, the skill of the models and contribute to better, uh, better products for the end users with um, better quality, not only for uh, the numerical uh, predictions of that, the meteorological variables, but also to bring to the, the end users uh, information about the quality of the air quality forecasts and aerosol forecasts. So the goals of the Wigan aerosol projects include the identification and quantification of the importance of aerosols for the predictability of the atmosphere in the short, medium range and the sub-seasonal time scales. The identification and quantification of the predictability of aerosols themselves, especially in the sub-seasonal time scale uh, for the applications in different areas like the uh, health impacts associated with the impact of air pollution in the, the health of the populations. Identifying the complexity of aerosols, uh, the aerosols models needed to provide the skillful uh, meteorological aerosol forecasts, and what's the complexity needed to represent aerosols in the models. And with these contests, it, uh, we should uh, update the knowledge about the current capability of the modeling centers, because modeling centers work in their in their own state of the art and what's the state of the art of the current uh, uh, modeling groups, what they can uh, develop and how they can uh, improve their model capabilities to better represent the impact of aerosols in different uh, time scales. And such goals uh, of the project uh, achieve the key scientific questions uh, rise it in the couple chemistry meteorology models for numerical weather prediction, air quality and climate uh, symposium that uh, was held in Geneva in 2015 uh, and led by WMO that uh, raised several uh, key scientific questions uh, that includes the, how the, 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 the integration of meteorology and chemistry in numerical models can improve the capability of numerical modeling systems and how important is the feedbacks between the aerosols and meteorology for the, the quality of the, the, the meteorological system, the numerical systems, and many other uh, uh, key scientific questions should be uh, answered in the Wigney aerosol project. Moving for the details of the protocol, the protocol uh, is aimed to, uh, in the that, that there is two components. One of the components, the regional component that includes the short range forecast that I'm not going to speak today, but uh, uh, you can find more information on the Wigney website. And uh, we are talking about here about the s 2 reforecast experiments that uh, includes the analysis of the experiments in a global, uh, uh, global scale. And the uh, experiments uh, include the analysis of different aerosol events to be analyzed. The main, uh, uh, the main impact to be analyzed, analyzed is the direct effect of aerosols, but the indirect effect, effect is one of the op optional uh, experiments that centers are invited to contribute if possible. So the aerosols events to be analyzed include dust, biomass burning smoke, and as an additional experiment is pollution in Asia. Uh, also, uh, modeling centers are invited to contribute to these three uh, uh, aerosol events. But uh, the dust and biomass burning are the two main experiments that should be provided for modeling centers. The s 2 reforecast experiment are based in the uh, are ensemble based, and uh, the protocol requires a minimum contribution of five member ensemble uh, 
with at least 32 day long simulation starting at 0 UTC with a time resolution of six hours. The experiments will include uh, it, for each experiment, for each uh, aerosol type analyzed, uh, the experiment should include the climatological aerosols and another experiment including prognostic aerosols. In the case of biomass burning smoke, uh, it should be included the experiment that, descri that describes observational emissions. Uh, models uh, capabilities uh, should be uh, decided uh, in modeling centers. So uh, the, the system should be initialized by their own analysis, reanalysis. The modeling center should be the best uh, uh, version that model can, can deliver that modeling group can deliver. Uh, and this is why the, this, this, this project is based in the capabilities of each modeling center. Uh, for the, true three, the three experiments, dust, biomass burning, and pollution in Asia, the starting dates uh, should, should, should be three different uh, dates, but because of computing uh, limitations, modeling centers uh, are invited to contribute, for example, for dust in the first day of May, for biomass burning in the first day of September, and pollution in Asia for the first day of January. And the high indicates include the period of 2003 to 2019. Uh, these three different periods include the for dust, the main uh, period that uh, is observed, the occurrence of dust, biomass burning, the period that is biomass burning is more intense, for example, in Africa and South America, the main, main period of occurrence of biomass burning in the dry season that occurs among August to October. And the pollution in Asia uh, includes mainly the winter time that uh, pollution is uh, worst in Asia. Uh, the storage data will be archived at CPTEC that is kindly supporting us uh, with uh, uh, storage. The format required is a grid view, preferable, but we are receiving uh, model data in NetCDF too. Modeling centers are invited to contribute with uh, global experiments uh, in a regular latch long grid of one degree of lat latitude and longitude and modeling groups should uh, provide a document describing additional information about modeling data, like uh, uh, how the initialization was made, uh, especially the emissions, how the emission was built, and more information like physical and dynamical uh, aspects of the model. The protocol has a, a forecast verification component that is a contribution from the Joint Working Group on Forecast Verification Research, especially to uh, access the, the skill of the air quality forecasts, uh, providing advices on how to, what's the best metrics to analyze uh, uh, aerosols and air quality forca uh, forecasts. And the basic statistics is that one that is commonly used for uh, access ensemble uh, predictions, like bias of the ensemble mean, correlation between ensemble mean and anomalies, uh, mean squared error skew score, standard deviation, and scorecards uh, is, a, is a very interesting tool that can be used in the analysis of the results. The reference database should include a uh, uh, global uh, data set like CAMS or MERA from NASA, and also Aeronet uh, database for aerosol properties. And weather variab variables should be assessed using synoptic, synoptic uh, network data and error 5 reanalysis. Uh, Modeling center should provide uh, uh, the deliver of the, the data sets up to August to, to, uh, this year, but uh, because of the pandemic and because of the many uh, 
issues uh, around the, the, the construction of the S2S uh, data sets, uh, modeling centers possibly will delay the delivery. So uh, the, 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 the deadline is not a problem. If you have uh, any problem with this deadline, please contact us. That should be uh, understandable, uh, the, the delay of uh, delivery of data. Uh, the procedure adopted to deliver the, the, the data to a uh, CPTEC server should be provided personally, so please contact me in order to receive information on how to upload model data. And about the progress of the, of the, the project, uh, in the beginning of the year, in February, uh, modeling centers met in a teleconference and discussed about the simulations in course. And, uh, China Meteorological Agency, CMWF, and NASA are, um, are, sim uh, are doing their simulations uh, in good progress. And uh, KMA and NOAA uh, are, are planning or were planning, and George will come to us with more information about NOAA. Uh, centers evaluating participation include the uh, Environment Climate Change Canada. And all meteor uh, modeling centers that are contributed to the project are invited to submit information about the modeling systems, uh, more the contact point in modeling groups, and uh, contact Andrea Molot to that is responsible for compiling this information. All this information will be put in the S2S website. And the next steps include uh, to provide support from CPTEC for data delivery and schedule a next teleconference in the beginning of the summer to discuss the project uh, progress. So if you have any questions, please uh, let me know. And uh, I, I, I acknowledge especially Inti for the support and, and uh, all the community for contributing to the project. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you very Ariane. Much. Um, um, your talk, talk puts, puts, I think, the rest of the talks in a little context, letting us know a little bit about the background, the motivation, and the protocol for the experiments. Um, are there any questions right now for Ariane? If not, you can type them in the chat. Um, if there are none, then we'll uh, ask our next speaker to start. Our next speaker is Angela Benedetti from the European Center, who's going to talk to us about some preliminary results from their experiments from this protocol. Thank you very much, Andrea. I'm going to share my um, presentation. Can you see it? Yep. Presenter mode would be great. Uh, beautiful. Right. I just did it. Hopefully yep. it's appearing. OK, great. Uh, so um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks to Ariane also for uh, putting uh, this into context. Um, this is work that I've done together with uh, Frédéric Vitar, um, uh, ECMWF. So let me just go straight in. Um, the development of uh, the atmospheric composition in the uh, ECMWF model, which is the integrated forecast system, has been actually going on for a number of years uh, since the late 1990s. It started with having stratospheric ozone, but then uh, through a series of um, projects called GEMS MAC and now comes the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitor System, a monitoring system, um, this, the model has been developed further. So, now um, it, it moved from like having only stratospheric ozone to having a couple chemistry, complex chemistry mo uh, model. And now this uh, uh, chemistry model being fully integrated in IFS. Uh, and also the aerosol model that was uh, developed in the um, starting from 2004 onward, it's uh, um, completely included in the IFS as well as uh, reactive gases, uh, sorry, greenhouse gases like uh, CO2 and methane. Um, throughout the years, there have been also some um, 
like improvements that have sort of fed back into the NWP configuration. Uh, I have to remind you that this uh, uh, complex, you know, chemistry and aerosol um, system is not run at the full resolution, but it's run in a configuration which is um, at a lower resolution with respect to the NWP configuration. However, in the NWP configuration, the climatologies for CO2, C uh, methane and ozone do come from the uh, CAMS system. Um, and uh, also the aerosol climatology is largely based on the CAMS interim reanalysis. Um, in the CAMS configuration, which is run um, like uh, operationally uh, under uh, the Copernicus service, um, they have prognostic interactive aerosols and ozone. In the NWP con configuration, uh, climatologies are used at the moment. So uh, a few years back, I think it was 2016, uh, Frederick and I started, you know, like exploring um, what happens when um, at the S2S scales, when we activate fully prognostic aerosols interacting with the radiation. Um, so we created this uh, experiments um, that um, I'm, you know, describing here. I'm going to show you some, uh, a couple of results from these old experiments now. Um, we included only the aerosol direct effects and this is still the configuration that we're running at the moment because we're not we don't have the capability to include also aerosol indirect effects at the moment we use uh, observed emissions for biomass burning plus all inventories that are you know um, included in the uh, in the uh, CAM system uh, the ensemble size is 11 members uh, at uh, T255, which is about a resolution of about 60 kilometers, 91 levels for this initial experiments with a, a cycle which is now old. It's cycle 43R1. That's the model version that was uh, used in these experiments. We used uh, five different start dates around uh, May 1st um, with for 55 cases in total. And uh, at the time we ran six months simulations. Um, the reforecasts were from 2003 to 2015, and the results are summarized in Benedetti and Vitar. Um, we ran uh, four experiments, a control with a very old climatology, so derived from Tegan and um, co authors, 1997, um, a second control run uh, using the uh, BOTSO. Um, and climatology, which is uh, um, which is currently used operationally at ECMWF. So this is the operational climatology, and then two prognostic runs with the interactive aerosol. One initialized from the CAMS interim analysis, and one initialized from a free-running aerosol simulation to understand the impact of the initial conditions. And I jump right in into the scorecards. So this, uh, some of you may be familiar with this. If for those of you who are not, what we focus on are a number of variables that are listed on the on the left. You see, you can guess the acronyms uh, T2 meter surface pressure. Uh, sorry, T, uh, T2 meter is uh, 2 meter temperature, surface temperature, sea surface temperature, um, and mean sea level pressure and so on. And then uh, temperature and winds at various levels, for example, 50 hectopascal, 200 hectopascal and so on. And wherever you see blue, it means that the prognostic runs did better than the control. So, um, um, and then when it is dark blue, then the, it's even significant impact. And we were really surprised to see this positive impact of the prognostic aerosols with respect to the run, uh, which was using the old climatology. Um, and we saw a similar impact we, when using the um, like uh, uh, the new climatology, although not as uh, as big. So basically indicating that um, aerosols are quite important for these scales. Um, and we started wondering why. Um, so we looked at uh, uh, aerosol, in this case focusing on dust, on the aerosol optical depth anomalies, and we dividing these anomalies um, according to the phases of the MJO. And uh, on one column, you see the results from the simulations, uh, PROG1, the prognostic uh, run with the um, um, interactive aerosols initialized from the CAMS interim. And then you see the CAMS interim reanalysis. 
And so this, um, we noticed that these anomalies were sort of like um, in phase, both uh, and in the simulation, in the uh, uh, forecast, uh, in the prognostic run, the, the fields, the shape of the anomalies was quite similar to those observed in the in the reanalysis. So we actually um, derive, I mean, from this we deduce that uh, um, there is a modulation of the aerosol fields induced by the MJO, and that can be connected then to the predictability afforded by um, having interactive aerosols. So this is like a mechanism, you know, explaining the impact. Um, then we also looked at uh, um, this uh, um, um, the skill of the model in predicting dust itself. Ariane mentioned it in her introduction that we also want to understand whether there is skill in the models in predicting the aerosols in themselves for applications, you know, in uh, health or other um, other fields. And um, we could actually see that the, our runs, the prognostic runs, were more skillful than persistence. Um, particularly the one initialized from the comes uh, reanalysis had a skill about persistence uh, out to week four. So indicating that uh, um, it is possible to have some skill in predicting, for example, dust aerosols a month ahead. Then we looked at some uh, extreme events in the uh, in our period. Um, there was 2015, which was like um, a extreme event uh, for Indonesia. And uh, we, um, if you look at the fire rate at the power average over August and October 2015, with respect to um, on the left, you see this huge, you know, like red areas basically covering the whole of Indonesia. Um, and we could actually see that in our forecast, the temperature anomaly uh, were indicating a similar pattern uh, due, um, connected to the cooling due to the smoke aerosols, and we could see it uh, up to six months ahead. Of course, we could do that because we had the prescribed observed fire emissions. So this is not really a forecast; it is a, a reforecast. So we we were able to prescribe those emissions. However, this events have some predictability connected to El Nino and also to our agricultural practices in the area. Um, so, you know, we know that uh, this is uh, um, like a recurring. Um, sorry, I just got uh, uh, to get the door. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Sorry, I got like a delivery in the middle of a seminar. <laughs> Of working from home, um, but um, we're able to, um, to uh, see this uh, as I as I said because uh, we have uh, prescribed the observed emissions, but we need to be you know to be able to perform this type of uh, you know uh, things. Um, we need a predictive fire dynamical model, and we have been trying to work on it for the last few years. Coming to the S2S coordinated experiments, so the setup is quite similar to the experiments that, that I just talked to you about, um, except that now we are running with the uh, more re most recent uh, uh, cycle version, model version, which is 47R1, um, and that has 137 levels. Still, we're using the same horizontal resolution. Um, T255, and uh, we adopted a similar approach, having like you know five start dates around May 1st and September 1st, for to increase the number of cases, so the statistical um, significance. And we are running only one month simulation, so this is really the S to S, the monthly run um, uh, setup. You know that it's um, the resolution is different, but other other than that, everything is the same with respect to the operational S to S runs. And the, the period of the forecasts is extended to 2019. So again, the control now uses the climatology from Bozzo and Cotters, which is, as I mentioned, operational. Prognostic one is uh, a run initialized from the comes analysis. And then we did another one to understand the impact of the initial conditions um, um, using uh, our interactive aerosols initialized from a fixed year, and we picked 2010. So, for the May start date, this is the CRPSS, which um, 
indicates a sort of mean absolute error for, for uh, probabilistic forecasts. And uh, we actually have, uh, this is control minus uh, prognostic, so we have actually a skill degradation in our experiments with interactive aerosols, and that's connected to aerosols. So on one hand, it's not going in the hope direction, but it is making our point then that defining aerosols is extremely important for these uh, uh, scales. Um, because you see like the, the skill, in this case, the reduction in skill is definitely connect, connected to the arrow. So you can see the signal. Uh, when we look at the September 1st update, actually it's the opposite. It is, um, in this case, it's uh, um, red is good. Um, so um, you, you see that it's, um, the, the skill of the experiment with the interactive aerosol is uh, higher and it's uh, connected again with aerosol. So you can see that actually the big uh, bullseyes there are um, in uh, um, over like the Amazon basin which and, and uh, Central and West Africa and that's definitely connected to biomass burning. We don't see very much signal uh, over Indonesia in this global plot. However, if uh, um, oh, sorry, I'll come to that actually because I looked again at the Indonesian fires. Uh, but first, uh, I want to show you something that was just like shown uh, last week at ECMWF. This is uh, um, the impacts in the medium range uh, from a comparison between the camps that, as I mentioned, as interactive aerosol in their uh, daily forecast and uh, the high rest run, which uses the climatology. And this is um, for a very long period, the comparison, it's um, uh, from March 2020 to February 2021. So it doesn't specifically focus on the biomass burning period. Um, however, and, and we have to um, remember that the resolutions of the two experiments are very different. One is uh, T511, so 40 kilometers, and the other one is T1279, which is nine kilometers. But again, have a look at the patterns. So here, blue is, uh, is better. So uh, the high rest is better everywhere except in areas of uh, biomass burning aerosols. And actually, here you see also uh, the signal over India. That's uh, possibly anthropogenic aerosol, not, um, not uh, coming from, um, from biomass burning specifically. So it's very interesting that we see like similar, uh, similar um, signals. And this is the scorecard for the monthly, you know, for the September start. And uh, although, you know, you'd say it's quite a, quite a, you know, it's more or less net neutral, but uh, you have a couple of uh, um, parameters, namely the two meter temperature uh, that um, has like some higher skill in the prognostic run with respect to the, um, to the um, control run. And then uh, you see that when you, um, um, initialize from a fixed year, so take away the interannual variability in the initial conditions. It's mostly like, you know, a positive impact, um, not maybe not significant, but mostly like positive. So it's very interesting also to see how the initialization plays a role in, in all this. Um, and this is, uh, yes, what I promised earlier, uh, looking back again at the Indonesian fires, but this time with the more recent model cycle, um, we, we see the same strong regional signal connected to wildfires as in previous experiments. So we were obviously very pleased about this. But again, we're using observed uh, fire emissions. So. Um, so this is my last uh, slide. Um, I say that there are still open questions for the aerosols in S2S. The complexities versus the benefits, it's difficult to find, you know, a good compromise that satisfies all the requirements, you know. Um, also, we need to find computational viable solutions because obviously the runs with interactive aerosols are more expensive. Um, and uh, more scientific in investigation is needed. Um, so far, limited uh, experimentation has been performed, and that's why the uh, WGNE Go S to S aerosol experiments that we are discussing today are so relevant. And uh, finally, you know, climatology is just a final thought. Are extremely useful, as I think I 
you know, showed, but not for extreme cases. And uh, there is a, a project at uh, ICMWF called Confess We Will, which tries specifically to address biomass burning as yes to s skills and the importance of it. So my runs are also put in that context. So yes, I think that's all I have. Thank you so much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Angela. Um, any questions for Angela? Uh, I have a quick one, actually. Yes. You showed. You don't have to show it back again, but you showed that image of the high res versus the the one with the interact the camps with the interactive aerosol. Yes. Um, and you showed the regions um, where there was improvement due to having the non climatological aerosol. And so I'm just wondering about your instinct about is had you given it observed aerosol for this that proper year, is that what's accounting for that difference in those regions or the interactive nature of the aerosol itself? I think it's in the interactive nature of the aerosols themselves. Um, because uh, it's uh, um, the run with the climatology still has, you know, some resemblance of, you know, biomass burning in those regions. Uh, but uh, for the current year, obviously, they were not perhaps as accurate, you know. And um, so I think it makes the case for uh, having prognostic interactive aerosols, you know, also at the high resolution. But there is still quite a bit of you know convincing to do and perhaps uh, more uh, aimed uh, experimentation that is for example you have to compare apples with apples so definitely have to do it at the same resolution to see that if you still see like the same type of signal um so yeah i don't know if that answers your question andrea but yeah that's yeah. i think it really comes from you know the aerosols being more realistic for that year okay um, I see something in the chat. Uh, yes, um, yes, it's considering, um, yes, I think this is something that we should um, explore, I think, you know, um, it will become uh, more computationally affordable, both because of the increase in the supercomputer power, but also with the use of single precision. Yes, that's not hasn't been ex explored. So I really think that that's something that in the future possibly will allow, you know, the affordability of the interactive aerosols, at least in the S2S, which will still remain at a slightly small um, course of resolution than the high rest. So it will not go to, you know, a five kilometer like what's uh, expected for the high rest. So yeah, that's definitely an exciting, you know, possibility. Thanks. <clears throat> if there's nothing else, um, um, we'll move on to our next speaker, Doni van Barahona from NASA GMAO, who's going to talk about the results of some preliminary results from some of the protocol experiments that, that we've been running. Can you share your screen, Doni van? Doni van, you're muted. I don't know if you're trying to speak. No, actually, I had to leave and come back because I couldn't share my, my screen, so I'm, I'm back. Do you, Inja, do you need to give him permission to do that? No, no, I, I, there was some preferences that I had to change, and then, but for that to apply, I had to quit WebEx. So that, it, it, it takes now. <laughs> let me see if I can share my screen. I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay. Let me see. Hmm. okay. Here we go. There you go. Cool. Uh, so let me go to. Are you seeing the presenter or the or yep, the full good. screen? The full screen. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little bit of our work on including aerosol cloud interactions in the GEOS and the NASA GEOS S2S system, and I want to acknowledge. Uh, my co-author, Sandra Mollot, uh, Shaldi, she, she did a lot of the work in here. She ran all the simulations and, and all the team of uh, GMO seasonal prediction uh, and development, which is uh, a lot of people. Um, let me see. Okay, I'm just gonna, there you go. So in, in since uh, our version two, we, uh, we implement a, a 
quite comprehensive, not not, not fully comprehensive as uh, you would have in getting an LDS or something like that, but compared to, to other systems, our aerosol cloud interactions scheme in GEOS is quite quite comprehensive. We try to address uh, um, the both the liquid and the ice phase. And here I'm showing a very crude cartoon showing all the all the different um processes where aerosol is involved. Uh, we have a droplet activation, immersion and, and, and freezing, a homogeneous freezing, we train aerosol, we have a, a different uh, processes going on at different phases, and all of them need aerosol information. So uh, GEOS is really, really uh, uh, intricated. It's really connected to the aerosol, linked to the aerosol in many ways. <laughs> So essentially, but we, we we simplify this a little bit. What we need, what the aerosol scheme and the two microphysics that we run uh, do is try to predict for the clouds at least the number concentration of ice uh, crystals and droplets in the clouds, as well as the partitioning. And on the uh, well, there is a special variable that we call uh, that uh, that you, we use to to decide what is the supersaturation prevalent in, in, in cirrus formation. So um this is the this is a well this is a simplified way of see what we need to prescribe if we want to study what the uh, what the aerosol or the indirect effect looks like in our model. So when you're going to study direct effects like in the protocol that has been mentioned uh, it's, it's a little bit easier because you, you can remove the direct effect you can cut cut uh, the the the, the link between aerosols and radiation and you still have a model that is usable you know that you have that has a mean state that looks reasonable here you cannot do that because uh, there are the our two moment microphysics needs the aerosol so you need to prescribe some aerosol or inform some aerosol or calculate it some some way so they are the two moment microphysics and the whole cloud module of, of geos actually can run and that poses a little bit of a, of a problem to try to investigate what is the indirect effect or what is the effect of the indirect effect on the model, because now you you need some baseline that you can compare against, and there are many ways to 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 to, to do that. For example, if you use a single moment microphysics where there is no connection between the aerosol and the clouds, the problem there is that you actually are using a different model, so you are actually comparing two different models, not the not the indirect effect in the same model. Uh, we can use a fixed aerosol climatology, but it's hard to get a, a mean uh, state that looks reasonable with that. Uh, you, need, uh, you need a lot of work to, to make this climatology work. And also you have confounding effects of the indirect effect and the fact that you are prescribing that climatology. And as, you, and as I was just mentioned, that, that could be important in some cases. We, what people usually do is take this number concentration and just set a fixed value. So the number concentration of droplets and ice crystals you set it to a fixed value, and the problem that is that if you do that uh, a global value, like let's say 10, 100 per cc in your clouds, then it's hard to get a, a, a reasonable climate. It's hard to get a model that will behave in, in a in a proper way. And of course, other processes like partitioning and supersaturation and all of these those are not considered. So what we did was to develop a climatology. So like using this fixed number, but then we prescribe a climatology, uh, a global climatology that, is, that changes with location and, and with month, um, that we developed from our full model that is able to predict these things uh, uh, on the fly. And what we get with that is that the mean state is close to the control. Um, so we actually have a, a climate that looks reasonable. But we, we all we all lost in, in in the way that we cannot still prescribe. We need some way to prescribe ice and liquid partitioning, which is not related to the aerosol. So we that that will make a different uh, model that is slightly different from our base model. And also, it's a conservative estimate. So we are giving a lot to the non-aerosol cloud interactions model. So it will, will look a lot like the like our uh, our fully um, fully prognostic uh, model. But this is the strategy that we're using. So in the, the context of this uh, intercomparison, we run uh, a number of reforecast experiments. Um, these are performed with two moment microphysics, uh, uh, all include aerosol and indirect and indirect effects. 
Uh, the only way that the only difference is the way you prescribe the baseline for that. Um, the, they are all run with full interactive aerosol, you think of car model, and there are a couple runs, of course, and a half degree atmosphere and ocean. Um, so we have two experiments, and I will show comparisons from three experiments or three report three series of experiments, three report cast uh, series from 2003 to 2019. And one is our version two the operational S2S, uh, GEOS S2S, uh, that has explicit aerosol cloud interactions. Um, I call that D2. And I will repeat this many times because that, those are the, 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 the abbreviations that I'm using. Mm. The second is that that I just mentioned, the we're prescribing droplet and ice concentration climatology. And what we try to do with that is get a model that can run with the two moment microphysics, but that, uh, uh, that, that has no connection between the aerosol and the clouds. So we call that no aerosol cloud interactions or no ICI for short. And then on top of that, we also run a model that has prescribed aerosol climatology. And that, that, uh, and, and that what we do is we don't run GOCAR, we just actually prescribe just a climatology for the, for the aerosols. That is derived from MERA too. So we do have any members ensemble, and we'll show, I'll be showing results for May at least one. And so this is the, 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 the capability, the current capability of GEOS. Uh, here I'm showing results, uh, retrievals of cloud droplet number concentration from MODIS, again, in the top row, against our version two. What I want to emphasize here is that uh, we, the, the, our model is, uh, um, has a pretty reasonable skill in reproducing the global mean cloud droplet number concentration. And there are some notable exceptions, especially in the, in the high latitudes, but I, we are very happy with this comparison because it shows that we're actually doing a good job in, in, in describing the microphysics of these clouds, especially the low level clouds. When we compare uh, here, this is uh, in, the low, in the bottom row, I'm showing the no aerosol cloud interactions run and the prescribed climatology. And uh, what I want to show is that they are actually very similar. These droplet number concentration between these two, they are similar. It's just that these are connected to the aerosol, these are prescribed. There are differences because of course, this is a monthly climatology, uh, which tends to smear out a little bit of this maxima. And also because there are also differences here in cloud fraction, another thing that will tend to, to also introduce differences in, 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 in here. But uh, they are very similar. Uh, even with the aerosol climatology, they do uh, very similar between them. So what I'm gonna show now is a series of results uh, that will tell a story, but this is a still preliminary work. We haven't analyzed fully these runs. They are actually pretty complex to analyze. So I'm gonna start with some by uh, some of the main biases, or some of the main differences that we found in these, in these runs. Uh, here I'm showing the near surface temperature bias against MERA2, and this is typical of, of our model. We tend to have to, uh, the, the northern hemisphere tends to be too warm, and the southern hemisphere a little bit cold. Uh, so um, if we remove ACI, that tends to alleviate, uh, in this run where we don't allow the, the aerosols to connect with the droplets, that tends to be alleviated a little bit, but introduces a cold bias in the northern hemisphere. Um, and it tends to alleviate a little bit the bias in the Arctic. That's actually not bad. So it seems that we are overdoing it with the, two, with the indirect effect, and I will talk about that. Um, one thing between these two runs, the no aerosol cloud interactions and the prescribed climatology, is that um, it seems that the aerosol cloud interactions is the main factor in this case. And the running an interactive aerosol, just actually non-interactive aerosol, uh, add a little bit on top of that. So it's just a in this case it's a minor it's a minor player. If we may, if I take these two and make, make the difference between this one and this one, that gives me what is the effect of removing aerosol cloud interaction from version two. And here um, I'm just emphasizing what I just said. It tends to produce a much colder, uh, removing aerosol cloud interaction tends to produce a much colder um, northern hemisphere and a warmer northern hemisphere. Um, which is actually pretty substantial. So we want to know what is going on there. Um, that's related, of, uh, it seems to be related to the low level cloud fraction. So that decrease in T2M and surface temperature or near surface temperature from removing a aerosol cloud interaction seems to be associated with an increase in low level cloud fraction um, and uh, in northern hemisphere and somehow a decrease in the northern hemisphere 
in the sorted hemisphere, I mean, and it, uh, it seems that in this case, for cloud fraction, in, in, uh, uh, the running a non-interactive aerosol actually has a, a larger effect and tends to exacerbate those biases, exacerbate those differences in a way that will make it uh, farther away from the version two, our version two operational system. <clears throat> This is also related to precipitation. So removing aerosol cloud interactions actually lead to uh, lower precipitation rates in our system in the Northern Hemisphere and an enhanced precipitation around the ITCC. And that's for the two cases. And in this case, again, is the aerosol cloud interaction that seems to be playing the, a major role. If we look at the typical bias of our system, and this is from the, the, the S2S or the S2S description paper, um, that enhance of a bias will actually uh, be, uh, will enhance uh, all that, that increase in, in precipitation in the ITCC will it, uh, it actually act uh, to exacerbate or to make the bias worse in our, in our system. So uh, if you turn that, that around, that means that adding aerosol cloud interactions is actually good for the version two because it, it tends to minimize the bias. Also, it may be, not as good in the northern hemisphere, so that's still not, not clear that this will actually remove that bias completely. Looking at more variable, this is the aerosol optical depth, and this is an important one because it seems to explain, uh, well, try to uh, advance an explanation of what is going on here. So again, this is the bias of version two against MERA 2, which is our uh, uh, simulated aerosol. And this is the difference between the no aerosol cloud interactions and version two. So what I'm showing here is that removing aerosol cloud interactions from GSS2S will result in an increased AOD in the Northern Hemisphere and lower AOD aerosol optical depth over the African continent and in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm. If you put that on top of this, then after the effect is not, it's still com small compared to the bias. Uh, and this aerosol cloud interaction actually uh, um, helps to minimize or to uh, um, reduce the bias between in the version two and our assimilated aerosol. So that means that adding aerosol cloud interactions actually help in, in producing a better aerosol uh, optical depth. Um, if we look around the block, this is driven, uh, and this I'm showing the difference between no aerosol cloud interactions and version two, our fully uh, uh, prognostic uh, system and for dust organics uh, sulfate and sea salt and it's probably this is a total extinction and the aerosol optical this is probably not the best term to use here but it, what I'm showing here is that it tend, this, these differences tend to get tend, are um, driven by sulfates and dust and especially sulfates in the northern hemisphere but that gives an, uh, 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 that give us uh, some idea of what may be happening. So to, to understand this and to explain this, we have proposed what we call the aerosol activation scavenging feedback. And essentially it works like this. If you have some aerosol, eventually that aerosol is gonna activate and produce some droplets. And that will set some droplet concentration in the cloud. Eventually that cloud is gonna rain and scavenge that aerosol, right? Over time, um, reduced aerosol concentration will lead to reduced activation and then a cloud that will be, because you have less, less fewer droplets, then those droplets will be bigger if the, if the liquid water content is about the same, and that will increase the precipitation and enhance the scavenging. Over time, this uh, cycle will tend to deplete both aerosol and cloud. So in our no aerosol cloud in, uh, interactions in scenario, what we did was essentially sever this the, the, this connection. So that means that there is no longer a connection between the aerosol and the droplets, which is probably what you will get in a system that doesn't have aerosol cloud interactions explicitly. And that means that over time, these scavenging rates are not going to be enhanced like in this case. You always have the same scavenging rates. Um, and that tends to lead to aerosol and cloud accumulation. That, that, that's what you get, at least that's what we hypothesize. That's what you get the, 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 dry, the enhanced uh, AOD. And also that, that will explain why you have a high, and we end up with a higher cloud fraction when we remove cloud, aerosol cloud interactions and a reduced T2M and reduced precipitation rates because uh, you have actually uh, more droplets that you are supposed to on the long run. Um, 
looking at what a cloud scavenging race actually supports, seems to support this, uh, this uh, hypothesis because there is seems to be um, produced phosphate scavenging rates in big parts of the globe. I thought it's not a smoking gun because you also have enhanced scavenging rates, but that's also because when you have more aerosol, you also have more sca uh, a higher scavenging rate, but that's because you actually accumulated the aerosol in the first place. So we need to do a little bit more analysis to understand this better. For dust, it's not as clear cut because once you get dust, the eyes and um, the, the, the ice mm, face gets involved and that that is not uh, that that makes things a lot more complicated and I will leave that for another talk. So in conclusion, um, the GS S2 S2S version 2 ensemble um, shows a skill in reproducing observed mean cloud droplet number concentration both globally and regionally. The inclusion of aerosol time interactions in GS S2S has significant effects on surface temperature, cloud fraction, precipitation and aerosol optical depth. Um, but using prescribed aerosol had a comparatively minor effect, except for cloud fraction. It's still, these are preliminary results. There are many things that we still need to analyze. Aerosol indirect effects seem to be too strong in GS S2S, uh, GS S2S, leading to biases in the opposite direction to the no aerosol cloud interaction scenario. And this is particularly true in the northern hemisphere. So we need to probably dial down the indirect effect in our model. And ongoing, of course, we need to see aerosol cloud interactions impact through the ice phase and on subseasonal time scales. And of course, analyze the forecast skill, but that's because that's probably what we are more interested in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doni Fun. Any questions for Doni Fun? You can type them in the, in the chat, of course, as as the webinar continues. Okay. If we have nothing for no questions from the audience for Donifan, then uh, let's proceed to our last speaker, uh, George Grell from NOAA's uh, Global System Division. Um, George, can you share your screen? Just waiting there for a while. All right, Beautiful. I'll talk a little bit about aerosol impacts on regional and sub-seasonal forecasting, what we're planning on doing for the Whitney experiments, and also uh, our motivation behind it. Um, there's a lot of people involved here. Shan Sun is doing most of the S2S work with folks. Uh, Jordan Schnell, some of the regional work, also with Wolfchem. And then there's uh, various developers and evaluation folks also a new dust emissions module from ARL that we're using. So too many people to put all on this slide. So why do we want to participate in this Whitney experiment? For one, we have a large interest in operational forecasting. Uh, the rap her smoke here on the left side is a storm scale hourly update cycle modeling system. This actually went into operations in December. Uh, and it does include aerosol interaction with respect to radiative feedback. And that is an NWP model, it is not an uh, atmospheric composition model. Uh, and I'll tell you just a little bit about that. And then there's GEFS aerosol, that's the lower, uh, lower left here, which is a new uh, global aerosol model from EMC, was implemented in September. Uh, that does not include the feedback yet operationally. Uh, aerosols in both models are based on WARF chem, pretty much a chem driver. Her smoke, uh, high resolution rapid refresh is what that stands for, by the way, it includes biomass burning and plume rise, wet and dry deposition, but it only has two aerosol variables because we were only allowed to increase the total computational time by 2%. Uh, the two aerosol variables are already required by the Thompson microphysics, double moment microphysics scheme. So the 2% pretty much comes from emissions and the additional smoke tracer array that we uh, that they wanted to see. The GEFS aerosol uses the go-kart bulk aerosol modules, uh, but Wolfchem plume rise, wet and dry deposition, and then the Feng Sha dust scheme, which comes from ARL. So we would like to gain understanding what level of complexity is needed to represent the positive effects of atmospheric composition on weather forecasting on different scales. Positive effects mean we want to see an improvement in the weather prediction. And to go back to uh, the Whitney 
one experiment, Ariana mentioned that already, this is where we started to get into this whole stuff uh, because we saw significant impacts when using complex physics chemistry with Wolfgen. Meaning we're talking about uh, modal to sectional aerosols and double moment microphysics schemes. We tried two different ones actually at the time and we tried running it all the way down to cloud resolving simulations, 1.7 kilometers. Uh, just to show you an example of systematic and random shortwave differences we've seen during that, uh, there's a bunch of random changes that are just caused by different location of clouds, not interesting at this point. And then there's some other ones that may be interesting. You can see some uh, possible uh, areas here that are uh, more reddish and more bluish. Um, but uh, the main focus for us at the time was on, on the runs, on, on the differences that we saw at every single run. The cooling over the main fire areas, then in a kind of a borderline region between very low AOD and higher AOD, uh, usually more shortwave radiations coming down, and it's the same over the uh, Pacific here, uh, over the cold water there. And notice this is at zero Z and this is at 12 Z. And you saw the same thing for the cloud resolving simulations, although for the cloud resolving simulations, at this point, we could only do one run at that particular time uh, because it got expensive and I lost the two people that were working on this. One left and then another one took over and then that other person left too. So, and then before we started doing this again, it kind of started smelling a little. When stuff gets too old, the mold makes it smell. So, uh, which is one other plot here I'd like to show how, com how much complexity can you lose. This is an example of doing a run with the convective parametrization with and without, without aerosol awareness. Uh, direct effect only, it shows the cooling as expected. And uh, for some reason, we actually did get the a warning up there uh, when we turn the aerosol awareness on. Now, meanwhile, we have changed a lot on the convection scheme, so we will have to rerun all this, and we hope uh, that's going to be uh, something that we can do for the new Whitney experiment. And to show you, we have learned from Whitney 1, including current and future implementations. Current implementation, the storm scale short range wrap per smoke which will with the future rapid rich refresh forecasting system based on the regional FE3. Uh, we showed significant improvements in storm scale metrics, T2 meter, two meter temperature, uh, visibility. Uh, none of the storm scale scores were uh, reduced. Um, and this was with an extremely simple two variable approach that doesn't cost much money. So this was implemented and is now operational at NCEP. And we are working on the medium range forecasting with FE3 GFS. Again, this is with the go kart about aerosol impacts on radiation. And we already, this is starting in December 2020 till now. And we have about a two point improvement for the Northern Hemisphere, a three point improvement for the Southern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, we also have much less standard deviation. So we're actually improving the median by seven points in the Southern Hemisphere during this time period just by including the feedback. This is using uh, the GFS version 15 as an example. So not the uh, just last week implemented version 16. Planned and ongoing experiments for Whitney aerosols 2. Regionally, uh, the RAP chem, uh, we'd like to use direct and indirect effect for the North American domain. This is something we, uh, I uh, worked out together with Paul McCarr for September 2020, which everybody in the US knows was a horrible uh, wildfire season here. And we'd like to include at least reduced gas phase chemistry and SOA aerosols, and I'll show you an example of, of that. For the global experiments, uh, currently operational aerosol setup based on GEFS aerosol, uh, but we use a CCPP implementation because we'd like to have it all merged with the physics. Uh, met Meteorology and ocean are based on either prototype six or seven, and I'll show you a slide of what that means. You would also like to do the same, uh, but with a Thomson microphysics, uh, which only has the two additional variables, which makes this possible 
to use an operational NWP if we can show that it actually works and leads to an improvement? That's the question there. Uh, and also, if aerosol awareness appears to work well for the GF scheme in medium range tests, which we're currently performing, uh, we will also try a run with uh, GF convection parameterization and the Thomson microphysics. So for the global experiments, one is our highest priority to finish that. And two and three may only be run for a limited number of cases. Uh, again, uh, resource requirements are not uh, limitless and they're not minimal for these S2S runs. For the regional experiment, again, that's September 2020. Uh, this uh, uses full meteorological data simulation of the RAP. Uh, COVID-19 adjusted emissions for last year. Those were provided by Chemical Science Laboratory. Chemical, chemical mechanism uses simplified carbon bond mechanism, coupled to VBS SOA, uh, 85 species only altogether. Uh, that was developed in collaboration with NCAR. Uh, online emissions, dust, we currently do not use Gokart. We do not use Feng Shai in uh, WorfCam because that's not included in this particular version. Um, chemical vertical misting is all in line uh, with the physics. And for physics, we use the MY and N EDMF approach, as well as GF collective parameterization. Photolysis and radiation do include aerosol direct effects. And for the microphysics, we want to use the Thomson aerosol aware scheme. We actually promised to do that for the wildfire project anyway. So this is kind of convenient for us to use September 2020 for this anyway. Uh, as an example uh, for uh, the Whitney aerosol project for the regional runs, this is not, this is only one day I'm showing here, but you can see on the left side for the temperature differences, uh, if you compare to the upper plot here of where the, most of the aerosols are at the time, you can also see that on the right side, the water-friendly aerosols uh, from GFS forecast, which is not really uh, that great because it uses climatologies that are uh, not the best, let's say. Uh, the wa water-friendly aerosols from the rep CAM simulated aerosol distribution is shown on the lower right. This is the initial conditions. And then the average daytime two meter temperature and boundary layer height differences are showing here. You can see the cooling and the lower boundary layer heights in the areas with a heavy smoke. Interestingly, you also see quite an area of slight warming. This is less than 0.3 degrees, but still. Uh, and also uh, a higher boundary layer height in this area. So planned and ongoing experiments for the Whitney Aerosol 2. We just gotten ready to get the model ready to do this. Um, what we're still missing currently, and we're still working on that, is biomass burning FRP data for the periods proposed in the experiment. Uh, we can also, we can only compare to runs with AOD climatologies that exist at NCEP, uh, but at least they will be changed to a new analysis based on MERA 2. And I think that has been done already. So we can compare to that, which is probably a lot fairer comparison than uh, comparing to the original uh, NSEP uh, analysis. When comparing to observations, we would like to be able to compare to our own climatology to see whether there really is an improvement because you really want to see the variability on top of the climatology. Uh, so the carpet modeling setup, horizontal resolution is 25 kilometers, dynamic course FE3, Using the Bokart modules and Feng Shai dust and the plume rise, also on 25 kilometers, of course, it's all inline. Ocean and sea ice, MOM 6 and sea ice 6 at a quarter degree. Initial conditions come from CFSR or CPC. Uh, for the aerosols, we have to do a spin up run. Um, okay, for the GFS version 16 physics, that includes the SAS convection, the GFDL microphysics. RRTMG radiation, NOAA LSM, and the new TKE EDMF PBL scheme that Jungle Han developed. Uh, the GSL physics we'd like to test too. Uh, that is currently used in her, includes, of course, MYNN EDMF, 
uh, GF convection and Thomson microphysics. And we would like to do 35 days uh, of integration and a minimum of two experiments, a free run starting from the cycling run, and then of course a free run uh, with aerosol radiation feedback. And uh, just uh, do we trust our capabilities to forecast aerosols? This is an example of GEFs aerosols, uh, which is what we're basing, the, basing this on uh, for a five month worth of averages. You have to think there's no data, simul no data simulation for the chemistry, only for the meteorology. So this is sort of a five month continuous run for the chemistry, although the meteorology does play a major role, of course, especially for dust and sea salt. Uh, this is just one example. We can, of course, also do uh, use the global model for regional domains. Uh, so for the September 2020, we can use both. We can use RAPHER and we can use, uh, for comparison purposes, the global model. At 25 kilometer resolution, we're really not that far away from uh, the RAP domain, the 13 kilometer. The HER is a different story, the three kilometer. But again, you can see that the overall the agreement is fairly good. There's definitely an over forecast here over the fire regions up in the northern US. Uh, what we're going to do, for example, here's an example of a free run June 2020. Uh, we have a spin up cycling run where we do daily cycling. Uh, we start with a cold start May 1st to have GFS initial conditions, uh, aerosols uh, with climatology and with daily cycling, we bring it up to June 1st when we start the warm free run. Uh, we have, we're planning on five ensembles. Um, this is just one example for this particular case, the differences that we see between the warm run and minus uh, I mean, the feedback run minus uh, the no feedback run, uh, you do see quite a bit of differences. Uh, we haven't really looked into yet uh, what these all mean and where they come from, uh, obviously from aerosol interactions, but whether it's more the direct or the semi direct impact, because the cloud effects are very large and it's usually um, much larger on uh, uh, radiation impacts. Uh, especially at top of the atmosphere. We can see that, for example, this is kind of interesting. Uh, unfortunately, we can only compare to uh, the 16 year mean, Sarah's mean. And uh, what you can see then is, although we are, uh, the short wave top of the atmosphere mean radiation is closer now to Sarah's, but the regional differences are kind of large. So, uh, but again, it is uh, one specific month compared to climatological mean. Uh, I believe that's over like 16 years. Yeah, 16 years. So we have to, uh, this is only the beginning of our runs. So we'll have to see where that's all is, where that all is going. And to make it short, summary and future work. Initial results are promising. Radiative feedback will improve results for forecasts on short time scale. There's no question about it. Because uh, you're looking at very different scores. Uh, you don't, I mean, high anomaly correlation doesn't mean anything on short time scales. Uh, what's really important there is uh, things like two meter temperature, visibility, also uh, other storm scale metrics like um, uh, uh, comparison to uh, radar data, for example. Radiative feedback may improve results for medium range forecasting. We can't show that for, for sure yet. Uh, we need much longer a period. Right now we only have four months. Uh, and we need fire data for S2S runs. That's something we are looking into right now. We'd like to use the same type of data set. Uh, that unfortunately is not available for more than 10 years. And it would be work to create it for the 10 years. Uh, and we will test simple as well as complex microphysics interaction. Thank you. That is uh, the end of my talk. Thanks, George. Um, I hope there's some questions. Time, time for questions for George from anyone. Either type it in the chat or unmute. George, you see the chat? 
I can see the chat. So we have a question from Anton. Okay, yeah, we got two questions. Great. Um, okay, elaborate on the need for missing FRP data. Right now, we're trying to use um, uh, operational for GAFS aerosol. We're using the GBB EPX data, which is based on the satellite data from, from VIRS and MODIS. And that goes back for the most 10 years. But we, we usually don't create those ourselves. We just get them from Nestis. So, and they would need to do some work to get them for us, which is not happening at this time. Uh, we can do our own data set based on MODIS data uh, for FRP. Um, we could certainly probably use GFAS fire emissions. Uh, I know that ECMWF both and as, as also uh, NASA probably have data that we could use. It would require some work, but it could be considered. You might be interested. Okay, there's more questions. From your experience so far, how many prognostic aerosol variables are required to have a positive impact on FE3 GFS? So far, we've only tried the go-kart aerosol runs, which for our runs, we actually need 19 additional prognostic variables. Uh, but we will try with only two plus the double moment microphysics. Uh, George, could you please elaborate more about how different the Thompson and Morrison schemes in treatment of the aerosol and CCN and EN? That's a really good question. Um, that's a very, uh, very much more complex in a Morrison scheme, uh, at least the way we used it, yeah. because it's based on Wolf work. And that is based on implementations from uh, DOE folks. Uh, it's much more realistic, in my opinion, the Morrison approach, but it does require a lot more variables and it's a lot more complex. Um, not sure whether that is good enough for you. If not, you might want to talk about this uh, on the site or after the fact. Operational rapper reporter paper is available for further reading, is being in the works, I believe. Uh, Ravan Amadov is uh, writing up the smoke paper and the aerosol paper. Uh, you could probably get an initial, initial draft if you're interested. Uh, what was the approach you applied to adjust emissions based on COVID-19 scenario? That was done by CSL. I can't tell you the details about that. Uh, Brian McDonald uh, was the one who did most of that work at Chemical Systems Lab, Chemical Science Laboratory. But I can bring you in contact with him if you're interested. Great, there was a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, one last opportunity to ask questions of any of the other speakers as well. I have a question. Um, Can I ask one for? Uh, of course. Uh, the, my previous speaker is Donna Don. And I believe you have also a um, uh, aerosol impacts in the RAS scheme, and I, I would. I assume you were using that in those runs. And if you were using it, did you also try a run without it and see what the difference is? Or if you're not were using it, are you planning on trying a run with it to see what the differences are? Actually, we in the, the runs that I show, uh, well, in our operational system, it does have aerosol effects on, on, on convective systems. When I run without the aerosol, the, the no ICI run that I was talking about, I did remove the aerosol effects on, on co in convective clouds. The thing there is that it, it is, uh, since our, we have explicit freezing and uh, ice nucleation in the convective core, then, then you need to prescribe a, um, a way to partition it 
to partition the, the ice and, and the liquid. So it's not just the aerosols, I, there are many, uh, more things that you need to prescribe there. And I, well, I, know I of course, prescribe some number of concentration. Thing is that, uh, as I mentioned, you cannot run without it. The thing is too integrated to run without aerosol plant interactions at this point. Uh, or you can run it, but then it will be a different model that you have to tune independently. Well, yeah, I guess it runs. Yeah, I one, did one, remove it. Hmm? One option I might be if you would try to run a different convective parameterization tool that doesn't have aerosol impacts. We are actually doing that because <laughs> I did into the GF microphysics. And what I'm trying, uh, so right now we just have to prescribe some properties of the of the detrain, um, the detrainment. Um, that, that, that's essentially the whole world. And there are things like, for example, when we were able to put this aerosol of interaction in RAS, then you, you can actually uh, simulate the microphysics of, of the plume, of each plume raising, right? So you can also tell something about what is the effect of the activation on, on auto conversion rates and precipitation. Right now, uh, to, to, to update to, to the GF parameterization, we're, we're actually just prescribing those things. Uh, so so the, the GF at this point is not, not seeing the aerosol. So the, we prescribe the size of the detrained particles, the partitioning between ice and liquid, and also whatever is in there with the um, auto conversion rates. And uh, uh, the idea is eventually to be able to, to do that, uh, to, to put a whole microphysics in there, but um, it's much more complex than doing it in RAS. RAS was more, a lot more modular. There are many, GS has a lot of, you know, connections and uh, other things that are not, that, that are, make things a little bit more difficult. Yeah, it would be interesting to compare notes at some point. We are using okay. aerosol impacts in GF scheme. So. Yeah, yeah, it would be very nice. But it's probably, uh, I know Saulo usually uh, goes off into many of these uh, very uh, uh, good in uh, putting in new impacts from, from all kinds of different places. So uh, uh, not sure how easy it will be to transfer. It shouldn't be too difficult. Yeah. Yeah, well, for you, because you wrote the thing. <laughs> well, yeah, all for Saulo, you know, Saulo can do that thing. Uh, okay, there is a question here for me, actually. The, the, does GS5 have precipitation hydro hydrometers in the upper levels? Yes, it does. It, it produces rain out of uh, ice crystals. Um, there is auto explicit autoconversion and accretion of, of uh, ice crystals in the, in the upper levels. So yeah, we have also a microphysics of ice clouds in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Andrea, just a quick, uh, just add a quick uh, information on the uh, regional experiment that George explained in the wildfires in California in uh, September 2020. Uh, ECMWF is also involved in, Joannes Fleming is analyzing the, the event as well. And any other modeling groups that are interested to contribute with uh, simulations for this case study uh, with regional or global models are invited to, to contact us and, and uh, be involved in this case study. That's great. Thanks, Ariane. Okay. Um, Let's thank our speakers one last time. Um, it would be great if each of you could send us the slides from your talk so we could either post them on the on the website or just have them for, for reference for folks. Okay. Um, so thanks everyone. Um, I'm not sure what the date of the next webinar is, but I'm sure folks will be hearing about it. Okay. Can, I, can I quickly answer to this last question? <laughs> uh, a continued question, does the precipitation of hydrometeors, uh, hydrometeors in GS5 uh, have, do, do the precipitation of hydrometeors in GS5 have horizontal advection terms? No, at least not in this version of the model. We're working on implementing MG2 and MG3. They do have prognostic precipitation, but this version that I show, no, as no and, and, and rain are diagnostic variables. Sorry, I just wanted to answer that. No, that's great. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thanks for organizing it. Yep. Bye, everyone.
Bye. Bye.